This is the Blue Eddy EB55 portable power station. If you are familiar with Blue Eddy, then this one should be recognizable at a glance because Blue Eddy uses similar design cues for most of their power stations in this range. Today's video is a detailed review and complete test of the Blue Eddy EB55. I will cover all of the features of this power station, share a few things that I believe set it apart from others in the 500 watt hour range, and discuss some things I believe can be improved in future models. If you came here to find out about a specific feature, check the timestamps below. Bluetti has the right idea when it comes to the shape of all of their power stations. The plain Jane rectangular shape is the ideal for portable power stations. This is the best shape because it allows you to sit this thing anywhere. You can stack this on top of something or stack something on top of it. Focusing on the shape might seem like a no-brainer, but for other brands, they add fixed handles with unnecessary shapes limiting their placement options. Portable power stations in this size need to be versatile, and this Blue Eddy hits the mark. The handle stows out of the way, further improving utility, and all of its inputs and outputs are on the same face of the device. On another positive note, I have worked with some of these power stations that have inputs on the side and outputs on the opposite side, and using those devices while charging can be frustrating in limited space applications. The last comment I have on the look and feel of the EB55 is that holding it in my hands leaves the impression of a premium quality power station. Nothing feels loose, and nothing rattles. Overall, the EB55 leaves me with a feeling of a good quality product on par with Anchor, Jackery, and other name brand power stations. A minor note on the design is that you can pick these up in blue, gray, or orange. Check out the link in the description to see what colors are currently available. This display is simple and functional. Taking a peek at this gives us three data points. The first is the input wattage, the second is the output wattage, and finally, we do have my least favorite method of displaying battery power remaining. In testing, this is my biggest gripe with the EB55. I am not a fan of these five bar increment gauges. The technology is available to show percentage remaining on a scale from one to 100. Other than this gripe, the display is bright enough and easy to read. There is not too much information and I'm surprised that the fact that they don't show which outputs are powered on with the display is not a feature that I miss. The individual buttons light up, although you really can't see it too well in this sunlight, but this is a sufficient and efficient indicator of which outlets are on. The display shuts off frequently which is only an inconvenience while making videos like this otherwise why waste the energy with a display that stays lit the eb55 has a lithium iron phosphate battery rated at 537 watt hours this battery chemistry is one of the most durable with a projected life cycle of up to 2500 cycles with 80 percent maximum capacity remaining this rating is much better than many other brands lithium nickel manganese cobalt batteries that are rated only at about 500 cycles with around 80 percent max capacity with heavy duty use you can go through five 500 cycles in one or two years. So for this battery, I expect to see a minimum of five years of quality use. It is important to note that although the battery is rated at 537 watt hours, in use, you can really only expect to squeeze out around 460 watt hours. Safety features prevent the battery from draining beyond a certain voltage, and your mileage will vary with the specific application. Manufacturers do this as a kind of built-in reserve that you will not be able to tap for battery longevity. The EB55 has 12 outlets, but for my applications, only 10 are useful. I have never used these 12 volt 5521 outlets for any device. I am curious if anyone actually uses these, and if not, why do they still show up on power stations? On the other hand, the 12 volt car outlet is something I use often to power my mini fridge. In fact, this is the outlet I use the most frequently. This outlet is rated at 10 amps, which equates to around 120 watts. Keep in mind the maximum rating for any of these clusters is a combined maximum, meaning that that is the total output of that section. So as you look at the four DC outlets rated at 700 continuous watts and 1400 watts for surges, 
this rating is for this entire cluster. Additionally, if you plan to pull more than two or 300 watts continuously, I would get a larger system. For example, if your device pulls 700 watts, this system will run out of juice in a little over 35 minutes. Pulling a high load frequently will likely wear out the EB55 faster than expected. If the EB55 fails, Blue Eddy has a two-year warranty, which they say is hassle-free. The USB cluster has one USB-C outlet rated at 100 watts and four USB-A outlets rated at 15 watts each. I'll test to see if I can pull 60 watts from all four of these outlets combined. The EB55's wireless charger is a 13th outlet. The light on the back has a low, medium, and rave mode. The SOS mode seems to be standard on most power stations. The EB55 can charge at an insane 400 watts with both AC and DC combined. The individual AC adapter supplies up to 200 watts and the Anderson power pole input accepts up to 200 watts as well. This massive recharging capability explains to me why there are two inputs on the front of the EB55. I'm usually not a fan of the Anderson power pole inputs. I mostly charge with solar power and almost all of my devices use only this eight millimeter input for both the AC and DC charging. But but those other devices are restricted to between 100 and 200 watts for max charging. Let's do some testing to see if the EB55 performs as claimed. But before we move on, check to make sure that you are subscribed and don't forget to hit that thumbs up button. So the first test that I like to do with portable power stations like this is see if I can boil a cup of water. I like to start my day with a cup of coffee and the most efficient way that I have found is to use a portable power station to boil that water. It's a little more efficient than using something like an open flame. I prefer not to have an open flame in my minivan camper, and so that's the method that I prefer. Unfortunately, the EB55 does not boil water using my little brim water boiler, so I would say that you will not be able to boil water or really pull anything above that 700 watt limit for more than a few seconds. My Brim hot water kettle does pull 1000 watts, so that is well over the design spec of 700 watts from the EB55. So the next thing I wanna do is see if I can cook a meal in the Instant Pot. The Instant Pot does pull just a little over 600 watts. So let's check it out and see what we can do here. So for now, I do have water in the Instant Pot. We can see the display okay. And I'll go ahead and hit the egg boil setting. So the Instant Pot pretty much jumps up to a little over 600 watts for the device. So this Instant Pot will run for six minutes to boil the egg, but it's also gonna preheat. So right now it says on, it's gonna preheat until it's done preheating. Once it's done preheating, it'll actually cook the egg for six minutes and then I'll have to vent off the steam. So while I'm waiting for this to preheat, I'm gonna go ahead and hook up this little heater to see if it will run both of these devices. Okay, so I have the Instant Pot on pulling 620. This thing pulls about 250. So combined, let's see if it will run both of those 870. So that's over the 700 watt rating, but well below the 1400 watt continuous rating. So I noticed here, I didn't want to touch the display button just in case I turned it off on my own. The display did shut off here within three to five seconds. So even just a little bit over that 700 watt rating, the Blue Eddy only ran for about five seconds or so. So if you have a device that's like really surging the 1400 watts, consider what its actual steady state usage is and that could potentially be something that would prevent this from being a good option. If you were gonna run something that actually pulls 1400 watts, I would definitely upgrade to something with a very large inverter compared to this one. So I am gonna go ahead and allow the Instant Pot to go through and boil the water, see how long this does. We're only at about 40% battery remaining on the Blue Eddy right now. So we'll see if that 40% will run this for 10 to 15 minutes. And after that, I'll see what we can do with solar panel charging. So I am checking in, the power station is on, the Instant Pot did just cycle off. 
but it's still running. So I think it's kind of hitting its steady state operating temperature. So it says on here, normally when it gets to the point that it's actually boiling the egg, this will start to count down. So we have not hit that countdown yet, but the Instant Pot is cycling its heater element, which is kind of doing this on off effect for the power station here. I'm gonna to continue to let this run. I am curious to see if it will go all the way and I'm still showing two bars. I have been experimenting with this Instant Pot lately and I don't like to run it inside of the minivan camper because it has this vent that causes steam and when you're done cooking, you pop the vent switch right there and a jet of steam, you know, goes up two feet almost above the Instant Pot. That is something that I don't want to have, you know, damaging the roof liner of my minivan camper. And it also would add the condensation that we already kind of deal with as we're sleeping in a vehicle like this. The Instant Pot has reached its operating temperature and I noticed that the EB55 is still on the battery is just not cycling as much. So we're up to operating temperature. I am curious to see how often the, and it just kicked on right now, how often it cycles over that period. It was almost a whole minute that it didn't cycle. So as it was warming up, it was cycling like every 20 seconds or so. But now that it's at its operating temperature, it's only cycling like once a minute for about 10 seconds. Man, I love the great outdoors, but I really hate all these gnats. Luckily, they're not biting me. They're just kind of floating around and being annoying. So that's something to keep in mind as you're going out for your summer adventure. I mean, sheesh, right? Okay, so the Instant Pot just notified me that it's done cooking. What I'm gonna do is go over here and carefully hit this vent button. This is, this is the kind of, this right here will end the cooking process for the Instant Pot. So we do have a little bit of a breeze and if that was in my minivan camper, you know, this steam would definitely be hitting the roof. I'm going to go ahead and check the battery here. Saying we got about one bar left. I'm going to shut that outlet off. And I would say cooking with the Instant Pot was a success with the EB55. The energy cost to cook with the Instant Pot is about 40% of the battery capacity. So if you are gonna use this for something like that, keep that in mind. Fortunately, it does have a high rated recharge rate. And so we'll test that now and see how much power we can get back into it. I hate to waste water, but... Woo, still steaming. EB55 is rated to take up to 200 watts of solar power, and I have a 180 watt solar panel mounted to the roof of my minivan. I'm currently getting around 40 watts of solar power from that solar panel. The first thing I wanna test is to see if I can actually plug that solar panel in with the eight millimeter barrel plug that's also on the EB55. It does have an Anderson power pole inlet, but I prefer to use those eight millimeter barrel plugs. So I am getting just a little bit over 50 watts. It is fluctuating between 40 and 60 right now. I'm just gonna unplug this. Hope they don't disconnect it. And plug it into the Blue Eddy. So I think the Blue Eddy is telling me no, I'm gonna have to use the Anderson power pole connector. So now I'm gonna try to unplug the MC4 connectors directly from the solar panel and then plug the solar panel directly into the Blue Eddy. The biggest problem with uh, having all these rooftop accessories is I can't run the van through like a car wash or anything. We are getting a lot of pollen. It's spring right now. With all the pollen, it just makes the top of the vehicle a huge mess. So let's see, am I gonna be able to get that out? Success. Normally there's a little tool I would use for that, but in my wisdom today, I didn't bring it with me. The other thing I don't have with me is my volt ohm meter to check the polarity. 
So hopefully the circuit protection of the Blue Eddy will prevent me from damaging the vise. So we'll go ahead and just plug it in. Hopefully I don't let the smoke out. So we're hitting almost 80 watts. So I just plugged the Blue Eddy charging brick in there and it has an internal fan protecting itself. Will this sit right here? Let's see. Oh, perfect. All right, so I have this precariously set up here. Obviously this is just for testing purposes. Still currently getting about 40, and you can't see anything in the sun here, 40 to 50 watts. Plug that in and boom, jumped up, added another 200 watts. I would say that the 200 watts from the AC inverter is absolutely a true statement. I've had a couple of these where it says, hey, we're gonna give you 200 watts or something like 100, but it only gives you 80 or 90% of that. We are hitting that limit there. And then on top of that, I am getting a legitimate 50 or 60 watts from the solar panel. So good job there with the charging capacity. This Anderson power pole cable is only about five feet long. So if you're gonna try to run your power station like I have, you know, a long distance, this is about 10 or 15 feet total from the solar panel, then you're gonna want probably a longer cable. And I would either get an Anderson power pole extension or an MC4 extension to make that work. The next thing I want to find out is whether or not the DC outlet on the Blue Eddy EB55 is regulated. These mini fridges run more efficiently off of a 12 volt DC outlet. And some of these portable power stations don't have a regulated uh, voltage. And the problem with that is as the power goes down in the EB55, the voltage of the battery drops causing the refrigerator to turn off. That's something that we don't really want to do with if the battery actually has more juice remaining to give. So using a regulated output allows that fridge to consume as much of the useful battery life of the EB55 without shutting off or going into its overload protection. Let's test this fridge and see, since the battery is so low on the Blue Eddy, I'll either be getting close to 13 volts or I'll be getting something like close to 10 because the battery is so low. I plugged in the refrigerator to the device. I'm pulling about 40 watts. I'm at a little under probably 20% or around 20%. I could also be 30%. I don't know because of that display. I am registering 12.7 volts under load, which is actually pretty good because that means that this is a 12 volt regulated outlet. And so if I turn off the refrigerator, I should be pulling around 13.4 volts. Awesome. In this same category with the EB55 is the Jackery Explorer 500, Rock Pals 500, Wopez 600, and many more. What sets the EB55 apart from those power stations is its AC inverter. We showed the limits of what it can do, and if you need to run something more powerful, Blue Eddy has some of the largest power stations available in its lineup. Jumping to the EB70 will get you a larger battery capacity, but if you're truly planning to go off grid, Blue Eddy has some legitimate backup power supplies that supply massive power. Watch this video, YouTube thinks you'll enjoy it.